Kastuba Das here with a big announcement for Wisdom of the Sages listeners. This August will be Ashram Month at the Super Soul Farm. Simple ashram living, rising early, morning kirtan, yoga and pranayama, healthy vegan and vegetarian meals, farm seva and being immersed in nature, and then gathering in the evenings for kirtan and readings. Plus, each week we'll have a lead presenter teaching a different facet of the philosophy and lifestyle of bhakti yoga. Week number one will be the exceptional bhakti lata teaching a course called The Beauty of Bhakti, bringing the culture of love and devotion into our lives. Week number two is my brother from another mother, Raghunath, teaching Falling in Love with Divinity, the Bhakti Yogi's method for opening the heart. And week number three is myself with a course called Following the Path, examining the history and teachings of Bhakti Yoga. You can come for one, two, or all three weeks, and the pricing is by donation. For more dates and information, go to wisdomthesages.com slash events. Peace. Hey Raghunath, tell everyone about our Patreon community. Sure, Kastuba. The Wisdom of the Sages Patreon community is an incredible online yoga resource. If you like the type of yoga, wisdom, and culture we share on the show, then our Patreon community is a great next step. This is a listener-supported podcast, and any level of sponsorship will unlock a wide range of live and archived classes, talks, and even workshops. Raghunath teaches, I teach, and we have a host of other excellent teachers on topics ranging from yoga philosophy, asana classes, storytelling, Ayurveda, kirtan, cooking, meditation, and a lot more. We even have an incredible online bhakti 12-step recovery group. So if you want to check it out, go to patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. All right, let's get it on. Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Live from Super Soul Farm, this is Wisdom of the Sages, a daily yoga podcast with your host Raghunath and co-host and senior educator at the Bhakti Center in New York, Kastuba Das. Welcome to the show, everybody. Welcome to Q&A Day. It's Q&A Day every Saturday. Today's Saturday, right? Every Saturday, we take questions from our listeners. And if you're listening to this on Facebook, we do this every day. We study the Srimad Bhagavatam, the cream of the crop, uh, connecting soul with higher power, with source, the deep study of Krishna Bhakti. We're going through all 18,000 verses. Isn't that exciting? The only thing that's unexciting about that is it ends. What do we do after we get 18,000 verses under our belt, Kostuba? You go back. You do it you again. You go back. and goes deep. You know, these books, it, it's not like it's a uh, catcher in the rye or something. Okay, I finished that. Next, summer reading list. This stuff, you just revisit it throughout your lifetime. It never ends. And it always, and it's like a, it, it's like a, a rosebud, it's sort of beauty in its bud, and then it blossoms a little more. That's also beautiful. Then it blossoms more, it becomes fragrant and beautiful. So these books, they blossom as we age, and they have different meanings for us at different vantage points of our life. So today, any before we get into this, because we are there any announcements, Mara? You got announcements? I see a slugging away in the kitchen there. We have a Bhakti Recovery Group meeting at 9.30 this morning. And then tomorrow um, we have the spiritual scientists for our interview day. And then mm -hmm. tomorrow afternoon, Yamuna Bihari is doing a Marma therapy workshop for our Patreon members. Okay, Patreon. Okay, let me announce the uh, Patreon. If you like what we're doing, we have a whole Patreon community. It helps support us keep this boat floating. You go to patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages and you can give anything you like. And then you get entrance into a vault workshops, classes, yoga classes, all things on Vedic culture and how to upgrade the quality of your life. Kostuba Prabhu, forgive me for cutting you off. No, I was cutting you off. No, I was forgive cutting me. you off. No, no, no. <laughs> so uh, tomorrow is once a month. It happens. It's the Urban Davy Sunday, right? Urban Davy, Lady Sangha. It's a monthly interactive women's discussion circle. That no boys allowed. <laughs> No voice left. Um, that seeks to make spirituality accessible to women in the 21st century. And so, you know who's their guest speaker uh, tomorrow? Who? Jamuna Jaya. What? 
We yep. love Jamuna Jaya. She's a regular Zoomer. She's, She's a, a Zother Zoomer. Zoomer. An other and a Zoomer, a Zother. She used to be every day until we changed the time. And so now she's only there sometimes, but she's an incredible, great soul, a uh, great yoga teacher. And uh, one of the most just bright people you'll ever meet, just, you know, full of enthusiasm and happiness. And the top she's a clown, you know that, right? She, she's literally a clown. Yes. She goes into hospitals, she's a professional clown, yeah. cheers up children. Yep. And her topic will be looking at true self care. There are many articles and books on the subject of self care, but it sometimes is hard to understand what it means for you and your very individual needs. And there's also the very real question of which self, which self are we caring for? In this oh, talk, like you like that? <laughs> okay. Like that. In this talk, we'll look at our personal feelings about self care and maybe even challenge the notion of what self care actually is. Okay. Well, I know what it is for me. What is it? Can you share? Manny. Heady, shave, <laughs> is it, is nice hot do? towel shave. Just, <laughs> just kidding. Um, <laughs> although when you're in Vrindavan, you do like to do that. Right? I do like a sh I do like a good shave. Whenever I'm in India, shave, I, just, I shave. sit down. I just say, "Shave me up." Never, yeah. ever, man out there. I don't know, ladies, don't go to the barbers. Really, I don't think. But the men out there, eat the best sense gratification that you're ever going to get, that's you know not against the law, is is a shave in india or nepal they give you so much self-love i could sit in that chair for hours <laughs> all right and so any, any case uh you can find urban davy that's going to be tomorrow at 11 30 till 11 30 a.m to 1 p.m they do it one sunday every month all right and so that's tomorrow at 11 30. you go to the bhakti center's website go to the um on, online events uh category and you'll find urban davy there They'll give you all the info and the links that you need to join it. It's free of cost. Alrighty. Alrighty, Prabhu. So That's great news. Questions? Let's dive in. I got a question for you. Hit me. Now, you know, we didn't have questions and answers last week. We just missed it, right? You were traveling. Oh, we were gone. I was traveling. And then the week before that, we began to read a question from a person named Noah, a very personal, intimate, uh, sensitive question. Uh -oh. And then, but we had the questions out of order. So then we jumped back and then we never got to know his question. All right, let's get him. And so we're going to do it now. Okay, you ready? Yep. So here it goes. This is for Noah. He wrote via email. How, where do you write to, to put in the questions, Mara? Wisdom of the Sage is 108 at gmail.com. Thank you, Mara. So, uh, <laughs> Noah writes, he writes, Don't hello. Let Mara speak. He writes, hello. I've been listening to Wisdom of the Sages for a few months. I find, I find calm and advice in your words. Well, I'm very, I, I tend to be very calming. Yes, you, you always. And uh, he writes, I came to you guys because my girlfriend and partner is a yoga teacher and she is studying bhakti. Interesting, right? Girlfriend gets you into it. She used to read to me some Bhagavad Gita chapters and we discussed it. Then romantic. she told me- That's that romantic. It is a good way you to- You want romance, you read some Gita and Krishna book to your spouse or your partner or the person you're dating. And you'll so, know on the first date if this thing's going to last or if, like this is <laughs> okay. not what I'm looking for. It's a litmus test. Uh, then she told me to hear you. In other words, the podcast. And here I am. Right. I am very far away from religious things, but this is more than that. This is a philosophy and a way of living. All right, Noah. I agree. Now, this relationship with my girlfriend is in a state of uncertainty. It's breaking mm. my heart already. Because some troubles and strong discussion, I'm not handling it very well. I'm depressed and so sad, and I think I'm pushing her too far. My question is, but this is going to be love advice from Raghunath, but in a spiritual context. You can call me Dr. Love if you want. No, help. Right? <laughs> My question is, how can I stop blaming myself, blaming for this and other things so that may not depend on me? So that's one question, right? I seem to be blaming myself at problem with that. Then the other question is, how do I feel better with the fact that she said she doesn't know if she wants to be with me? And now I am waiting in the name of love, but I feel so much anxiety and sadness. I'm here because I love her and I believe in the power of love, forgiveness, and sharing all the things we like, but she's still lying at me about things. I don't know why I am here. I'm still here waiting for her. Is this love? What do we have to learn 
why do we have to learn the hard way? I'm committed to this relationship with heart, body, and mind, helping and sharing, because it is the only way for me. But now she's not. This male had been in, in the drafts since a few weeks ago, but this is the moment. Thanks for being and serving with great kindness and honesty. I'm starting to connect with my spirituality, and it is because of you guys and because of my girlfriend who introduced me to Bhakti. Raghunath, help Noah. What have you got to share? Uh, I'm going to go with the second question first. Okay. Good, good question. I get it. Um, yeah. Ambivalence. In the, uh, there's ambivalence on her part. Um, I tend to find that we have a God-shaped hole in our heart. You heard me say that a lot. Mm -hmm. the, the, the hole in our heart is God-shaped. It's not... Um, it's not money shaped. It's not travel adventure shaped. It might appear that way. Like if I go to trap, if I travel more, that will really satisfy me. Right. Or it, sometimes we have it, it. It's multiple partner shaped hole. No, it's not. And, or it's the one, she is the one, or he is the one, uh, the soulmate shaped hole in the heart. Although a person and so it's it's not like it's an evil thing. It's a noble thing. He wants to settle down or be with someone, give their love to that person. The problem with it is because we are spiritual beings and there is a God-shaped hole in the heart, that desire to connect will never be completely fulfilled unless spirit is put in that hole. God is put in that hole. Sweet baby Krishna is put in that hole. Whatever you want to call your higher power is put into that hole. From that, our emptiness or our zero-ness, feeling like a zero without her, without um, this fi an economic, you know, financial platform. When I get to here, then I'll be happy. When I get this position, I'll be happy. I'm expanding on this because it's not just a person that can make you feel empty. We have this emptiness in the heart. It's a very normal thing. And when we start to recognize, like, what am I trying to put in that God-shaped hole? Then I can start to see, well, wait a second, maybe I have to find God to put in there. Maybe I have to put spirit in there. And something interesting happens when I become connected. That's when I become one. That's when I become whole. That's when I become uh, complete. There is not another person that can make you complete. You know why? Because even relationships, even loving relationships are temporary. And then you're back to an emptiness again. So when we become one with God or connected with God, then we actually have something to offer the other person. Otherwise, I let that other person be my God and you become extremely needy to them or vice versa. It'll be you'll you'll never be able to love them as much as they need that love because they also need to be connected. The best thing I could do for my kids and people do this with children, too. I just need a child. I just need a child. I just need a child. Guess what? We just need really to be connected with God or else the parent becomes very needy from the child. Never meet a parent like that. Mm -hmm. So it, it's one of these things that once we become connected, then we can start to become qualified to actually give love or else we're making something or something else our God. And it's a really, it becomes a very awkward relationship because basically I feel like a zero, they're a zero if they're not connected and zero plus zero does not equal one. You know, so that's my uh, God shaped whole spiel. I find it incredibly useful um, whenever time there is that. I, don't get me wrong. I go through the same thing. I feel a little lonely. I feel like a little needy. I feel and I want to do so many things to fill that hole. Sometimes we want to eat to fulfill that hole. So we want to binge watch movies or podcasts to fulfill some hole. Something that I know is not the highest version of myself to make me complete, but I'll do it. And I'll feel either sometimes we'll feel sad, more sad, or sometimes we'll do something that makes us feel ashamed. Right. So better at those times when there's that emptiness is you just turn towards your spiritual practice. So I'm happy you're into this spiritual practice. It's it's good. And it goes very deep. And truthfully, sh people will become more attracted when you're grounded to you. It's a more of attractive thing. And you feel less of that neediness and that anxiety you're speaking about, Noah. Um, what was the first question? Oh, how can I stop blaming myself? Yeah, yeah. You know, um, I, I, I feel like when you do what I the first part of what I just said, that'll come very naturally. 
because part of our spiritual path is a forgiveness. We forgive other people. We take no offense when people, you know, um, uh, harm us or speak ill about us. We take no offense. And we actually start to project that inwardly. We have to also forgive ourselves for our situations and what we're in and what we've, our past. Our past is forgiven. You should understand that on a spiritual path, our past is forgiven and we move forward from there. It doesn't mean we shouldn't, um, if I've done something that's really problematic or hurtful, it doesn't mean I shouldn't feel that tension in my heart. It means today is a new day. Let's not do that today. I can't beat myself up over the past, right? All I can do is move forward today. How's that, Kostuba? I liked it, Ragnar. Thank you for that. Well, all right. You, you know, so you're saying that um, if if he obviously he's feeling some some sort of emptiness or pain, and you're saying that that needs to be filled with sweet baby Krishna or with spirituality in some way. Yeah, I mean, and there's then, so many ways we do it. Um, I mean, it's not just like okay, I got to sit there and pray on my knees all the time. We're doing it this weekend. We have this whole retreat here. It's like a it's like a what is this it's like yoga summer camp here for adults you know and it, and it's and it's spiritually conscious it's good people it's high conversation high vibe conversation it's mara's cooking cooking for us for she's cooking right now for us um uh, food cooked with love it's 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 sharing meals together it's singing together it's beautiful that's also we just need to add that to our life and in that even though we're all together we find a type of um, connection with ourself. Hmm. And therefore, I'm not asking them out of desperation to fill that hole in my heart, but they're buoying me. Is that a word? Buoying? Buoying me. They're, they're lifting me higher. But in that higher, I'm finding my, I'm not going to say independence because independence is alone, but it's a, it's, a connect, it's a higher connection. And they're just my support team, you know? Hmm. Well, like so, like yeah. all the leaves, all the leaves are connected, but they're not connected with each other. They're connected with each other through the roots. Hmm? Hmm. So hmm? so you're giving like a very broad kind of response to this. In other words, it's like you're talking about like a whole life strategy shift that because but but you know that life strategy it when it hits the ground it it it, it becomes really significant, right? Like if you're turning to this woman and you're doing it with the particular need from her. It's likely that that's the conflict lies somewhere there, right? You're going to drive her right out of the house. <laughs> you know, I, I can tell already. I, I know I've seen this dynamic happen too many times. She's going to run for the hills because yeah. she's going to feel this guy's too needy for me. This too needy. Be, become a little complete and it becomes much more attractive. Right. Right. Okay. I Isn't that I true, though? That's when you find the person. You, don't, you generally find a person when you're not looking for the person. They just show up there. Hmm. Thank you, Dr. Love. <laughs> it's okay to call me that. <laughs> Professor <laughs> Love, maybe. Okay, I got a question okay. for you, my friend. Who's it coming from? This is from our good friend Jiu-Jitsu Nav, Matt Godden from oh. Ithaca. Okay. Black belt in Jiu-Jitsu. Hare Krishna America, Stuben Raghunath. First off, I apologize for my ignorance or any offenses I cause. If I'm wrong with any of understanding with any of my understanding with anything, but in particular regarding the following, since I'm asking about it. So forgive him in advance. I'm looking for some information on demigods. Ooh, me mm. like you already. This question. <laughs> I did my Shawnee worship today. <laughs> did you for real? I did. Yeah, every Saturday. All right. Shawnee worships in Shringa Dave, though. So it's, well, good. it's all there in little baby Krishna. It's it's just, good. It, 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 yes, yes. But the demigods are there to help you. Worship also. your sweet baby. They, they're all there when you worship him. They're all happy when you do that. They'll be happy. <laughs> Shawnee will be happy when you worship little baby Krishna. Be happy. Why are you? Because it's Saturday and Shawnee wants to worship on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you running here and there? <laughs> <laughs> I am looking for some information on demigods. I understand that Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. Is this why I'm not answering this question? Because you th thought I was right. going to move it to demigods? Demigod <laughs> no, worship? I had no idea. Okay. And no, no connection there. Okay. I also understand that the demigods. I didn't are know you were worshiping Krishna. Shani every Saturday. Actually. Every Saturday. <laughs> Heading black dogs. <laughs> right. It's true. It's part of worship of Shani. Pet okay. black dogs. I'm entering my Saturn period. You should be doing that. You're in your Saturn period too. Yeah, yeah. 
Maybe we should have got an entire show on the demigods. I also understand that the demigods are servants of Krishna, but above humans, and that people who worship them will eventually go to their planets. Not necessarily, That's but the there are. Says. They can okay, but there are some <laughs> things I am confused. But does about. it say it in Amar Chitrakata um, comics? My Amar Chitrakata comics highly recommend the worship of demigods. Why do we also call the demigods Lord? Is there another title that should be used since Krishna has also the title Lord? From what I've read so far, Prabhupada was against the worship of the demigods because one should worship Krishna instead. Krishna can do anything the demigods can do because Krishna gives the demigods the ability to do what they do. So what is the what is it that some temples have deities or pictures? It? Why is it pictures of demigods in them or people have them in their home temples? And why, oh, why does Raghunath worship Shani on Saturday? <laughs> That's the big question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is a very good question. I can see how it can come up. And, you know, let's just start here. Let's just say that the, the word Lord, um, basically it just means someone with some kind of influence or power, you know, control. So, like, even, like, we have landlord or, you know, different things Ooh, like that. Or, very right? good. Landlord. We have a landlord, landlord because they have a certain, you know, they, they rule a certain domain. And so, like, a lord is a ruler. But, but um, you know, when they talk about Krishna, like, you know, say, for instance, like, Ishwara is similar to the idea of lord, right? Mm -hmm. Ishwara generally is translated as controller. Um, but then, you know, there are many controllers, right? But, but ultimately, there's one controller of all the controllers, and then we call that... Paramishvara, like the supreme controller. So when we speak about Krishna, he's not only Lord, but he's like that we, the supreme Lord. You know, according to Bhagavad Gita, for instance. Um, but let's let's get into the broader question. Um, you know, it can be confusing, right? Because you have this, and this is something we've been talking about a little bit lately, that this tradition is very broad, and if we come from, let's say, like a Judeo-Christian kind of background we're used to things being presented like here's god right no one else is god <clears throat> there's one way to get to god you accept it and everything works you don't accept it and you're in big trouble and that's how things work it's a very clear um you know very clear every every single person is being asked to do the same thing now when you get over to like the east things get like broader and more nuanced so here the idea is according like when you when you take the vast works of say Vyasadeva, you have the four vedas you have the upanishads you have the mahabharata with the bhagavad-gita and you have vedanta sutra which is a summary of the teachings of the upanishads and then you have um 18 puranas which each of them have you know thousands and thousands of verses in them and then ultimately you have Srimad bhagavatam where in our faith we believe that's where it all culminates so it's like a vast presentation. And the idea is that it's going to encourage you on whatever level you're at. It, the, w again, our belief, and we can explain our reasons for believing it, we accept that everything's finalized and, and, and concluded with and explained when you get to Srimad Bhagavatam. It's the key that helps you understand and put everything else into perspective. But not everybody believes that or gets that or, or follows that idea. And so the idea is that Vyasa was giving, he, the Bhagavatam is meant for people, what did we read? We read earlier in the week, right? People that are non-envious, right? Remember that, we're going to Yep. And, and so in other words, when you no longer want the things of this world, right? Even when you don't even want to escape from the pains of this world, but all you want is divine love, then you're ready for Bhagavatam. Then you're ready to hear, okay, there's a focus of that devotion. That's Sri Krishna, because he's the one that's behind everything. And he's and he's and he's got this special beauty and special heart, loving heart, and and when you're just ready that I want nothing but love, that's all that he's interested in, and and you can connect with with Sri Krishna. But you may not be there. You may be a person that says, actually, I'm interested in the things of this world. Well, then Vyasadeva isn't going to say either accept Krishna or you're finished. He's going to supply you a, a much broader idea of ways that you can take steps forward. And so in the Vedas, so, so what I'm going to explain now is you're going to hear about the devas, the demigods throughout all of this literature, 
and it's being explained in different ways. But you could, I'm going to give a summary. It's relatively a simple summary because there's so many nuances. There's so many different paths and people of different faiths and different interpretations. But I'm going to kind of just summarize it relatively simply. And that is, let's say people are approaching the devas on three different levels, or under, they, their approach or they understand the devas, the demigods, on three different levels. One is the way the karmis understand the devas. Another way is the way the jnanis understand the devas. And the third way is that the bhaktis, the, the bhakti yogis understand the devas. Okay? So we're going to go through all three. And when we say, kar let's start with the first, karmis. Karmis mean people that, their idea is that I want to enjoy this world. I think the point of life, right? When I wake up in the morning and I look at the world, the way that I conceive of the world is that my purpose here is to try to find as much enjoyment in this world as I can. And so generally, their view of the Deva is that that's being informed by the readings of the four Vedas is polytheistic. They believe that like each one of these Devas is a different person that has power and that all the gifts of nature that we receive are coming through these empowered beings. And so a wise person will do different rituals to thank, show their gratitude to all of these different Devas. It, and, and but they may particularly focus on one or two, you know, according to their particular needs or desires. Really, their their comma, right? Their their it's really based on desire. And um. And or they also there may be like one of these devas that is like in their family has been worshipped for many generations, and they see this as their ishta devata, their particular personal uh, deva the personal demigod that they worship and and so these people are going to see like all these demigods are like separate manifestations um empowered beings that should be honored and, and appreciated so that's the karmic idea now the gyanis see things differently they believe that all the devas are manifestations of one divine impersonal god right that god ultimately has no form and that the forms of the devas are, are the, the energy of that non-personal God is shining through these different forms. So it doesn't matter which one you pick because it's all that one God shining through it. And then they also believe that those forms, like all forms, are illusory. Mm. So they see those forms as like, it's, it's kind of like being involved, getting, bringing your attention or they would say your devotion to those devas, it's a way, it's like a way of beginning a practice where you, you learn the art of concentration through the worship of a personal form of God. It's a temporary, illusory personal form, but it has form, so you can meditate on it. And through, through that meditation on this form and, and offering, you know, doing your puja and meditating on that form and also through doing unselfish work in this world, you become, you, you learn to the, the art of concentration of meditation and you kind of purify yourself of your lower desires. And then as you start to elevate yourself, you, you begin to acquire knowledge about that impersonal one and you begin to bring your mind there and you transcend all ideas of form and so on. So that's like the way that the Ghanis conceive of the devas. It's like, they're, they're ultimately unreal. And, and uh, but, but they become folk, you know, like objects of meditation. Mm. Now, the way that the bhaktas, the bhakti yogis, and the way the Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita, I mean, Bhagavad Gita is like really clear on this kind of stuff, is that um, for the most part, the devas are individuals, that, like the, the posts, right? Just like you have like a, a secretary of state and you have a secretary of commerce and a sec, you know, like there's all these different posts and different individuals fill those posts at different times. Mm. So like Indra is a post and... Chandra is a post, the god of the moon is a post, and, you know, they, they live for a very long time, so they stay in those posts for for, for extremely long times. Four years? But, is it four No, years? longer than four years. Longer than four years, okay. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and, but, but, uh, they're, they're special, to, to get those, those posts, to get one of those posts is like a rare soul, it's someone that's acquired punya, like we say, like, they, they've, they've, they've acquired, like, pious merit over many, many lifetimes. And now they're playing that role. They're, they're really unique and special beings for sure. And they have been empowered, but who have they been empowered by? They've been empowered by Sri Krishna, that they were all, um, 
in one sense, like the servants in his cabinet, you could say, and they're supplying the rain and they're supplying the sun and, and et cetera, like that. All the goddesses, all the gods, they're all empowered servants of Sri Krishna, who's like the one behind it all. And so the bhaktas look at the devas as like objects of respect. Um, uh, but and what I was saying to Raghunath right here, we believe that by by pouring water on the root, by serving Krishna, the devas are very pleased, mm. right? And therefore, there's not there's no necessity for any separate. Uh, we're, I'm sorry if that is ruining your shiny mood here, Raghunath. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> shiny right. worships Lord Nishringadev. Okay, he's a, he's a great devotee of Lord Nishringadev. Yeah. Yeah, you, if you read, for instance, the Brahma Samhita begins to speak there. It's it's a it's a book where Lord Brahma, one of the the great devas, is expressing his devotion to Krishna, and the way that he sees the forms of the devas in relation to Krishna. Now, when you get to the book, you see, if you read the the four Vedas, it's going to set. It's going to be easy to interpret them as if like all these devas are just these empowered beings that are dishing out, doling out like material benedictions. Um, and you could walk away with it easily with the impression that uh, this polytheistic idea. And then again, that that it, that Gyani idea, that it wait an idea, it's a monistic idea. That that there's this one impersonal supreme that temporarily manifests in certain ways, but those are illusory forms. And the whole idea is that, you know, the the karmi they, with the polytheistic idea, they want the things of this world. I want wealth. I want health. I want the birth of a healthy child. I want rain for my crops. I want these different, all these different things. The the Gyanis, they want freedom, right? They, they want freedom from the sufferings of this world. They want release. They want moksha. It's called it, right. They they so their connection with that deva is with the purpose. I want I want freedom from the sufferings of this world. But the for the bhaktas, it's whether it's the devas or anyone else in this world, they see them all in relation to Krishna. They, they, they understand that Krishna is the cause of all causes. And, that, and when you get to the Bhagavad Gita, it really gets abundantly clear on this kind of thing. There's no like unclear language. Krishna will say about the karmis, he'll say, that due to, due to um, kama, due to their material desires, Hritya jnana, their, their knowledge has been stolen. Their jnana has been stolen, stolen by their desires. Right? When, we have, when we're full of material desires, we can't understand things as they are. It's a great and saying, says, isn't it? Your knowledge has been stolen, been stolen by, by your desires. desires. Yeah. Those, who, <laughs> those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desires surrender unto the demigods. That's what Krishna says. And he talks, he talks about this in several places, but in that section, that's text 720. And then he goes on to say, I am in everyone's heart. He says, those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desire surrender unto the demigods and follow the particular rules and regulations of worship according to their own natures. So those petting rules a black and regulations. Dog, petting a black dog. Petting perhaps. a black dog could be one of those, <laughs> according to their own natures. Watering tree, feeding living <laughs> entities. <laughs> yeah, so many things. And, and, and then um, he says, I am in everyone's heart as the super soul. And as soon as one desires to worship some demigod, I make their faith steady. He says, Achalam uh, Shradham, that, that I make their faith steady so that, so that they can devote themselves to that particular deity. Now, that's the interesting idea, right? Hmm. It's like Krishna is not like, I'm a jealous God and they need to surrender to me, otherwise they get punished. He's saying, if they want the things of this world, well, they can approach the devas and the devas will supply that. And, and I, I will even like from within, encourage them to follow that path because it's moving forward right the Someone idea is that saying, i'm not the doer that i'm i'm there you go that that's the that is the essence of materialism like i get what i get because i work hard for it right. you know and, and, and it's just not true there we're, we're getting things there's so many reasons we're getting what we're getting and once we see it outside of me being the doer and the controller that's the first step outside of the materialistic uh mindset which is sort of like a prison yeah and so yeah. So it's a step forward, and Krishna is encouraging them, right? Oh, go, okay, go ahead, worship the devas, get the material things in this world, enjoy them. That'll have you living a more pious, uh, it, it'll bring out some of the good in you. But you know what's going to happen? And this is how the material world works, right? Ultimately, you lose those things, they're temporary, mm. you mm. suffer. Then you begin to think more like the Gani, right? Mm. I want release, right? 
and and so you know you, you move up you know, he, krishna goes on to say endowed with such faith with with such faith they endeavor to worship a particular demigod and obtain their desires but in actuality these benefits are bestowed by me alone mm. right it's like it's kind of like if there's a butler in the house or you know and and the butler's feeding you know the the, the children every day bringing in their meals and so on Sure. And, and they may think if they're totally selfish, they don't even thank the butler. But if they're beginning to become a little cultured, they thank the butler. Oh, that's a good example. Right. But if they really know what's going on, they thank their parents because it's their parents that are paying the butler and supplying everything so that the butler can bring that food. It's really coming from the parents. Good analogy. Good analogy. You like that? Okay. And so Krishna's saying, I'm the one that bestow whatever it's coming, they can just turn to me. I'm bestowing it all. Ooh. Um, and then Holly Brown says, put a quote on the board. She quoted 923. Oh, but, exactly Good job, yeah, Kylie Brown. This is why well, you got to join our Zoom group because you get to butt in, you get to add your own two cents, you get to give your realizations, <laughs> right. your favorite hashtags. We love it. Okay. Okay. So, so there, Krishna says he he actually says it. You know, it sounds a little harsh, but Krishna's just being clear here. He wants to be clear. And when you get to the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna's clarifying a lot of stuff. That is more ambiguous in, in the earlier literature. But he's, he says, he calls people that, that are worshiping Davis, he says, they're alpamatism. They're people of small intelligence, right? In other words, it, yes. it's less, you don't that's really get what's it. going that's on. If you, think, yeah. if you think the butler's actually the one that's supplying the food, no, he's just kind of like serving it, right? right. But, but, but there's someone behind that. So That's says, why I thank the butler in my service to Shani. Go. I'm thanking <laughs> okay. the butler. That's right. Thank you, Butler. Now, now, if you continue to read the Gita, it's really clarifying who Krishna is in relation to the devas. And there it said that, you know, Krishna is the Uttama Purusha, like the ultimate person, the Parama Purusha, the supreme person, the Purusham Shashvatam Divyam, the everlasting divine person. He's called Adyam Purusham, the original person. He's, it, he's, it's said that he's Bhutva but, Bhutva Bhutvana Bhuteshu. Deva Deva Jagatpate, that he's the origin of all living beings. He's the Deva Deva. He's the God of all the demigods. And that he's Jagatpate, the Lord of the universe. And Krishna will say that even the Devas cannot understand his, his personality. That's in the 10th chapter. And in the 8th and 13th chapters, it describes how he pervades the entire world and he pervades all living beings. So even part of the idea is that if we offer worship to one of the Devas, Krishna is in the heart of the Deva, you know, and in a sense, indirectly, he's receiving that worship. Um, so, so this is kind of the gradation that like the, the Bhakti Yogis, you know, the Vaishnavas in particular, they, they kind of see things like this, that the Devas are very special. Some people are going to worship them for the things of this world and they'll think they're supreme. They can think that they're moving forward. And some people are approaching these Devas as objects of meditation to kind of transcend the sufferings of this world. That's also a step forward. But when we have the full picture, mm. and that picture is, is there in Bhagavad Gita, it's, it's, it's expanded on in Srimad Bhagavatam, that we can understand that if you go back and back and back and back and back, ultimately you'll find Sri Krishna. He's not a jealous God. He will encourage you to worship the devas uh, if that's where you're at, if that's what you want in your heart. Mm. But, but, he's, but it's a process that will hopefully gradually bring you to him but the bhakti yogis say, I'm not interested in the gradual path. I want to go direct. You know, Nikusuba, want to, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. You know, I think a lot of times, especially in the Western world, we hear about worshiping the demigods. And we're like, what the hell are we talking about? Who worships demigods? But it's a massive thing. Not just in India, the worship of demigods, but cultures, the Romans, the Greeks, they all worship demigods. Native Americans. In, in Native, they worship the idea of these, these powers, these higher powers. Yeah. And when I you mean, live... Yeah and you're growing your own food, you have some type of deep respect for the sun, for the rain, for the wind, for the seasons, for the earth itself. So that type of giving thanks and giving appreciation is always been there. It's only in this culture that we've created now where we're sort of like divorced from nature. And we're just, yeah, it's supplied by the supermarket. The Trader Joe's supplies my food. You know, that's when we start figuring, you know, we start cutting demigods, higher beings, even God out of the picture. And I seem very self-sufficient. And mm -hmm. um, so this is not such a foreign thing, the worship of the demigods, but there's a clarification, which I, I really love all your analogies here that beyond, beyond the supermarket, beyond the butler, right? There's mm -hmm. mom and dad. 
and they're yeah. the ultimate suppliers. Thank the butler. That's a good hashtag, Mara. Thank the butler. <laughs> but don't forget to thank mom and dad. But don't think forget to thank mom and dad. Yes. Okay. So I hope that's helpful, Matt. I I found that helpful for me, Prabhu. Okay, good. Well, then now you now you. I learn from you. Now I want to learn from you, and I have a question <laughs> for you, from Mitch. Let's come from Mitch via hmm. the Discord thread. We have a Discord thread. People are still do. using that. That's a Patreon member thing you People, get on the Discord thread. People love the whole Discord thread. It's a whole labyrinth of people. I, every now and then I open that app. It's like a whole thing is going on that Discord thread. And they all, you know what I've noticed about that? They all have code names. Yes, like, you know, here we have like David Charles Wilson, Megan McDonald, Skyler. On Discord, they're like uh, the the uh, you know the the, the dark death lord, doula. <laughs> the death <laughs> doula. Yeah, just like these crazy names. They'll never get their straight names on Discord. <laughs> All right, go on. So, so um, this is coming from Mitch. He's got a regular name, Mitch. Unless that's Mitch. not Mitch's name, and it's like a made up. Wait till he gets on Discord. He'll have some crazy name. No, this is from Discord. That's my point. Okay. Um, so Mitch writes, when we talk about pride insofar as not becoming prideful about one's own spiritual path or perceived progress how does that intersect with being excited passionate and jubilant about sharing krishna with others mm -hmm. often i find it is accompanied by some pride the same i'd have in a professor or parent or sibling or something like that Pride, rather not. Mary, you know what exactly what I'm going to say. We did the whole, we did a whole show okay. on Super Soul Sacred Sangha on the rebranding of gay pride. Do you remember that? It was like the most politically like incorrect, incorrect thing I've ever done. But right. it was just like the concept of pride usually has to do something of like there's been some hurt. It's sort of reactionary. Um, I know when we were you and I were young, and me and Parmananda were straight edge in the hardcore scene. Everybody in the music scene was really into drugs and alcohol in a real degrading way. So we had the straight edge pride. We were proud. We felt downtrodden and we had to like, sort of like stick up for ourselves. And you see it with a, a black pride or a white pride and people have the, we're trying to bolster ourselves because we've been hurt and we feel like we need to advocate for ourselves here because we feel like the pendulum is now swinging the other way. But the concept of pride oftentimes creates more division. <clears throat> and the idea that I think that we're looking for is we want acceptance. We want to be accepted for what we are. And it's okay that people are different, but we this is this is what we believe in. And what we should really be proud of is not necessarily that I'm in a particular group or my sexual preference or my um, skin color or my nationality, but I should be proud or feeling of integrity with my behavior. That's what I should, I should feel good about my behavior or I have the right to feel bad about my behavior as well too. If I did something that is, nowadays we say, well, don't shame. You shouldn't shame yourself or hate yourself. No, it's, a, it's okay to feel ashamed if we do something that's shameful. That doesn't mean we have to live in that shame like the earlier question said, how can I forgive myself? Yeah, forgive yourself, but move forward with meritorious activity. And th there's this idea of, you know, especially in uh, contemporary society, we say we say, there's no right or wrong. It's whatever you do, whatever you want to admit, whatever you make right is right. The Gita thinks something different. And the metric for measuring what is right and wrong, what you'll feel good about yourself, or when you start to hate yourself in a downward shame spiral, is very succinctly pointed out. And we were reading this in our, our reach uh, with our uh, retreat this weekend in, in, the, in the Bhagavad Gita in the 16th chapter, where Krishna really clarifies. Could you say that again? Sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. <laughs> this watch is driving me crazy. This watch, it's listening to everything I say. It seems like you're sitting too long. Yesterday, I had to stand up during a meeting because it said I was sitting too long. Stop talking to me. Okay. Where was I, Kastuba? 16 Howard chapter Shane bottom cycle. of the Yeah, yeah. So here's the thing we should feel good about. We should feel good about. 
I'm going to read from the 16th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. I really like this. All right. And Krishna is going to, and you might, it's going to describe the qualities that will assist you in your liberation. There is a good, the metric is what is good will make you feel free, will make you feel connected, will make you feel whole, will make you feel um, uh, uh, um, in this world, but not of this world. And the metric for bad is the things that make you feel stitched to this world, bitter, angry, down, dark. We know these feelings, but Krishna is going to spell it out right now. Krishna says fearlessness, purification of one's existence, cultivation of spiritual knowledge, charity, self-control, performance of sacrifice, study of the Veda, austerity, simplicity, nonviolence, truthfulness, freedom from anger, renunciation, tranquility, the aversion to finding fault with others, compassion for all living entities, freedom from covetousness, gentleness, modesty, steady determination, vigor, forgiveness, fortitude, cleanliness, and freedom from the freedom from envy and from the passion for honor. These transcendental qualities, Arjuna, belong to those with divine nature, right? So sometimes when I was reading those, some of you are like, oh, don't have that one. Don't have that one. Oh, I'm not going to get that one a little bit. To the degree that we cultivate these in our life, we will feel a type of self-love, not a type of, let's not use this word pride. Let's use this word, you'll, you'll have some self-love. You'll move in this world with integrity, okay? And then, of course, uh, in the next verse, it starts to describe just the basics of those who will feel bonded in this world. And that is Dumbo Darpa Bimanascha, right? Pride, pride, the first one, pride, arrogance, conceit, anger, harshness, and ignorance. These qualities belong to those of demoniac nature. Now, don't feel bad if you have some of those. We all have a little bit of everything. We're all like a mixed bag. We're all mutts of these qualities. But as we lean ourselves in our spiritual life and lean into those divine qualities, we start to change. We start to change our behavior, our activities. Um, we start to change our, our circle of people we're hanging out with. But this concept of pride is not necessarily a great thing. Oftentimes, it's um, reactionary. What do you think about where I'm going with this whole thing, Kostuba? Well, I definitely think that's everything you're saying. You know, there's a truth to it. I'm wondering, it seems like um, Mitch's question may be going to like, is there a type of transcendental pride? You know, like, is is it okay if I feel some pride for being part of, you know? I just wouldn't call Krishna. it pride. I would, I, I would call it like a joy in what you're doing. I, I think it's normal. If you love something, you want to share it. You know what I mean? I don't think that's a, it's great the, the word because pride. not because of me, but it's just great and joyful. Yeah. And yeah, I like I love classical music. It's great. You should listen to Chopin. He's incredible. What he does with a, on a piano. Oh, my God. You know what I mean? It's got nothing to do with pride. It's like and it's OK. Like, like for example, I, I'm I'm my, my grandparents are Italian. I'm Italian. I, lo I love to go to Italy. It's not like some Italian pride. I just I'm attracted to the culture of Italy. You know what I mean? So it's it, it's not a I'm proud to be Italian. You know, I, I think we're or they're just mi misusing that word. When we hear these words pride, it generally builds up a wall. And I think in, in a spiritual lens, we want to break down those walls. We want to start to see each other as underneath those labels. It's OK. I like the fact that there's different uh ethnicities and clubs and, and cultures. Why? Because I love to go to New York and eat Thai food. I love to go to New York and eat Indian food. I love to go to New York and eat Korean food. I'm glad there's differences. And there's sort of a type of, and there's sort of cult, different cultures that makes the whole world a more interesting place. But- Do you ever, okay. do you ever feel proud of your children? Proud of my children, proud of my children. It, it, it's more to do with them making choices of the of a meritorious, I'm asking, I'm not, a meritorious I'm asking, activity. 
All right, so if they make a choice. You, but I'm asking you, what do you feel? Do you feel something like, oh, I'm proud of them? It, it It's a feeling of, it's a feeling of I'm happy they're making good choices. I I feel good that they're making good choices. But once it gets to be like, yeah, I'm proud of them because I get, you know, because I did this for them. All I can do is present them with stuff and they make a good choice. And I feel good because I think it's going to give them a good reaction. I, I don't I don't want to take credit for it. Once I take credit for it, I'm, I'm in a type of illusion as well. Well, I feel good that they're making good choices. Yeah. But it, when it when it flips the corner or tips over the side where my kids are better than those other kids who made those dumb choices. You got to be careful with that as well. I will feel good if they act in integrity, if those meritorious choices they make, or if I've made a meritorious choice and a choice and it rubs off on them, then I'll feel good about myself. I don't like the word pride though. I think it causes too much division. What do you think about that? Um, yeah, it, maybe it's just semantics, you know, but it, it, yeah, you know, um, I, it, one thought I have is that maybe like in the initially when we take to the path, we might feel a sense of pride about it. And as we mature, like maybe that sense of pride, it, it plays a little role, you know, to keep us like, kind of like enthusiastic about it mm. as we move through a world that's kind of trying to distract us at every other moment. And we need to make clear distinctions between what I'm doing and what I'm not doing, right? Right. But then as we become more secure, that faith becomes more solid, the, the realizations become more deep, then it's just like I'm, you just feel fortunate, not pride, you know? And, and then maybe, but then on a super elevated esoteric level, one might feel pride. Like this isn't a very, very esoteric level, right? Like, you know, there's like the Christian's friends feel pride that, you know, that's, you know, Christian, he's from our village. He's, you know, he's our boy, you know, it's like, right. you know, that, that's like, that would be a whole nother thing. But, but I, I think what you're talking about is in this more practical sense, like in the, in this world that we're living, we're kind of trying to let go of, of, um, of that. And, and, and maybe any pride that we feel it, it's likely that it's, um, there's some blend of sectarianism in there or some, some blend of, um, neediness on our part. Well, uh, and as we mature, we're less needy for that. Or a type of worth. If people are like feeling lack of That's worth, what I mean by need, the, the need for yeah, a feeling of worth. A lack of worth. Then you, you get self-worth, not by associating with yourself with a particular group of people. You, you get your self-worth from doing worthy activities. Okay. Thank you, Ragnar. Well, you're welcome. Good answer. Where are we at? So, you got time? For one more, I think one more. I got to split early today, but we got six minutes. Uh, well, you got to, I got to split early too. How about that? All right, let's make it quick. You got to split early. I got to split early. You got things to do, <laughs> Kastuba. <laughs> You're not the only one. What do, you, what do you got going on that's so important after this class? Oxford studies. Oh, uh, I forgot exclusive. the <laughs> Oxford <laughs> studies. A very exclusive group of scholars. Well, I've got a exclusive group right here on this super soul farm we got very exclusive things we're doing today <laughs> seek our secret society all right all right all right maybe we should maybe question. we should split because i would like to give you a little more time to this question actually you know oh, you want to stop now yeah let's save it for next week all right we only have a few minutes yeah. save it for later who is that I know a band that did a song "Save It for Later," but didn't sound anything like that. Save it for later. Then, then, who was that? That was uh, the, the band later. that came out of. Uh, that was the the beat. Save the it for beat. later. Right. That was the Come beat. on. Who? The beat. The ska band. The English beat. The English beat. beat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Leslie Vente. Are you got okay. you got the music, Mara? She's no. running slow. She's rolling burritos. Come on, Mara. <laughs> She's not ready. Oh God, I might be ready. Well, we finished like, early. Yeah, 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 it's not your fault. It's on us. It's not your See, fault. But I, get, I get these commercials when I pull things up now. I know, it's horrible. Can you hear it or not? Oh, yeah, there you go. All right. Thank you, everybody. So I little get unprofessional. commercials on YouTube. It's like roofing. You need roofing? We got roofing for you. I was like, <laughs> where, where did I sign up for roofing? That's like the same ad I get every time. Well, this is awkward. Maris, you got to play the music a little louder, Mira. 
can't hear one word, Mara. I can't put it right on top of that microphone. There you go. That's it. That's it. Thanks everybody for joining us. Oh, everybody on Facebook, join us. Write to Mara, Wisdom of the Sages, 108 at gmail.com, and she will send you the secret code so you can join our coven of sacred white witches. Coven. <sighs>